United States goes to the polls to cast its ballot in the first wartime presidential election in 80 years. Throngs of voters, nearly 50 million, turn out to choose between the Democratic candidate, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the Republican candidate, Governor Thomas E. Dewey, through the medium of the free and secret ballot. Civilians vote throughout the country in cities and in rural areas. Members of the American Armed Forces on battle lines around the world cast their ballots. Nearly four million servicemen and women voted. Governor and Mrs. Dewey vote in New York City. At the town hall in Hyde Park, New York, President Roosevelt casts his ballot. The counting of the national vote begins. Swiftly, bipartisan election boards tabulate the figures. Radio stations and networks rush the election returns throughout the nation, and by shortwave, the voice of America informs the world. In Times Square, New York, a half a million people gather to follow election results. At Republican National Headquarters, party officials closely follow countrywide statistics. President Roosevelt's early lead is maintained throughout the night. At 3.15 in the morning, Governor Dewey concedes the election. It's clear that Mr. Roosevelt has been re-elected for a fourth term, and every good American will wholeheartedly accept the will of the people. I extend to President Roosevelt my hearty congratulations and my earnest hope that his next term will see speedy victory in the war, the establishment of lasting peace, and the restoration of tranquility among our people. At his family home in Hyde Park, President Roosevelt receives the congratulations of his fellow townsmen. The election of 1944 is over. By vote of the majority of the citizens of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt is elected president for a fourth successive term. At the Stevens Hotel in Chicago, the first international conference on post-war aviation opens. Many and varied are the questions to be discussed by the arriving delegates of 51 different countries. Chief among these questions is the future freedom of the world air transportation routes. On a globe of the world, delegates discuss proposed international airlines and terminals, preliminary guidance in making the significant post-war transfer of many important military routes back to civilian operations. States Assistant Secretary of State Burl delivers a message from President Roosevelt. On behalf of the United States, I offer a hearty welcome to the delegations of the 51 nations represented at this International Conference on Civil Aviation. You are called to undertake a task of highest importance. I am very sure you will succeed. I hope you will not dally with the thought of creating great blocks of closed air, thereby tracing in the sky the conditions of future wars. I know you will see to it that the air which God gave to everyone shall not become the means of domination over anyone.
2,500 mile advance in the Pacific, Guadalcanal, New Guinea, Tarawa, Eniwetok, the Admiralties, Biak, the Marianas, Palau, Moratai, and now the Philippines. Leyte Island in the central Philippines, the first target, General MacArthur leads the returning Allied forces. Accompanied by his chief of staff and air commander, MacArthur directs operations from the flagship of the largest ocean-going landing fleet in history. Landing in the heart of the Philippines, Leyte Island, the United States amphibious forces open fire. An imposing contrast to the tiny naval squadron that took MacArthur under orders from the Philippines two and a half years ago. of troops speed ashore. A quarter of a million trained American troops take part, more than landed the first day in Normandy. <laughs> Filipinos are aided by the first men ashore. Although terrified by the bombardment and some wounded, Filipino patriots risk their lives to help speed the advance. Tank landing ships bring up heavy equipment, in landing on Leyte, the 6th United States Army caught the enemy by surprise. The Japanese had expected the blow elsewhere. MacArthur leaves the flagship to go ashore. In the landing forces is every able-bodied man who left the Philippines with him. Sergio Osmena, successor to the late Manuel Quezon as president of the Philippine Commonwealth, accompanies the general. A significant moment for these two men and their fellow countrymen. MacArthur returns as he had promised. him from the amphibious force assembly point a thousand miles away, MacArthur brings power. Our forces free Dulag after heavy shelling. The first groups of civilians are liberated, first of 18 million Filipinos. In Tacloban, capital of Leyte, at liberation ceremonies, President Osmena speaks. Over the first of 7,000 large and small Philippine islands, the flag is raised. An offensive that began 16 months ago and 2,500 miles away now opens in earnest against the enemy in the great strategic Philippines. Supreme Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower and United States Commander Bradley visit General Patton at his 3rd Army headquarters in the center of the German front. Enemy resistance has been heavy here.
Hamburg forces of the Third Army drive forward in the area near Metz. Their objective, a small enemy-held town, as the Third Army moves slowly but irresistibly on. 